Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. I'm Jill Hurston, the Marketing Director for CenterZip. And just real quickly, I just want to give you a quick over overview. CenterZip is a SaaS software uh, product development partner. Um, we have a state-of-the-art de state development center in India with over 500 developers of various skills and technology levels. And we work kind of as an extension of our clients' in-house team so that we are one co cohesive team. Um, centers that enables our U.S. clients to achieve 24-7 development cycle. We can rapidly ramp up your teams in days rather than months. Uh, we have long-term flexibility and we can usually save our clients about 50% over hiring locally. So with that being said today, our webinar isn't about CenterZip, agile technology, or software technology. But because we have a database rich of small to medium businesses who can surely take advantage of today's topic, we thought this would be a good one to present to you. So with that, I'd like to introduce our moderator today. She is CenterZip's COO, Florence Lowe. She's involved with client engagement, uh, finance and administration. So with that, Florence, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks, Jill, and uh, thank you everyone for attending. Um, I'm very excited to present this to you all today. Um, just so you know, this has been an interesting topic, something we've been talking about with our clients um, a lot, um, and we're seeing a lot of interest in this webinar. So thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm very excited to have the panel that we have on here with us. Um, we have Robert Wright, uh, Bob. Um, I've known Bob for over 15 years here in the Dallas uh, technology ecosystem. His partner at Wright Gnatzer um, uh, Law Firm and Adam Minow from Newport Beach, California. I'm going to do a brief introduction of both of them and then we're going to get right into it. I know you all have a lot of questions. Um, so Bob is a, Bob has uh, about 20 plus experience, uh, 20 plus years experience working with technology companies. He has been an entrepreneur himself and has been responsible for bringing uh, a few companies to, uh, to uh, an IPO and raising a lot of money. Uh, his current practice helps small and medium-sized businesses, a lot of them in the technology field, uh, with uh, all manner of uh, legal um, uh, advice. Uh, so Bob, thank you so much for joining us at such short notice. Um, and um, thank you for, for every Thanks, Bob. And for everyone's uh, information, um, I do want to uh, just go back a little bit to our, uh, uh, just a, uh, a, a, none of this here is meant to be legal or tax advice. As you know, all of this is changing very rapidly, moving really fast. Um, and this is, this is a discussion with uh, experts, uh, but uh, this is not legal or tax advice. Um, our second panelist, Adam, thank you so much for joining us from Newport Beach, California. Um, Adam works as a CPA and CFO advisor to Main Street, small and medium-sized businesses. Um, uh, he has a string of uh, letters uh, after his name that are all very, um, very hard, well, well earned. Um, and Adam uh, uh, is a graduate of the University of Chicago and uh, comes to us with a wealth of knowledge of working with a number of uh, uh, clients as a trusted business advisor. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Adam. Uh, so let's get right into it. Um, the question I asked both Bob and, and Adam is, what are the top five things we should be doing right now in, 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 this, in this time? Adam, do you want to start? Yes, so uh, e absolutely everybody here should be concerned about what's going to be happening, what is happening in the economy. Uh, China, when it first uh, experienced this pandemic, experienced a approximate 30% contraction in their, in their economy. So uh, we have to be prepared for uh, an economic contraction of the same or even a large magnitude. I'm approaching business very bullishly. Uh, I think people are going to fall into two buckets here. People that uh, see the world changing and uh, are looking for opportunities to 
uh, expand their presence, uh, confront new challenges, and uh, see where life takes them. And uh, people that are really hunkering down and uh, may see their businesses, uh, like restaurants, uh, eroding uh, instantaneously, or even uh, software development companies that don't have cash flows yet and are worried about VC financing rounds and things like that. So. Uh, what can you do now to prepare for any sort of challenges uh, that lie ahead? Because either way, uh, we want to be able to have access to capital and uh, be able to prepare for whatever challenges may, may lay ahead. The first thing I say is contact your banker. Uh, have that relationship. Hopefully you have a business banker, uh, somebody that you can call. But if you contact your banker, uh, they are... Uh, hopefully going to be responsive. I've had a lot of success with uh, the community bankers, uh, some bankers that I deal with in my business every day, and some of them are really on top of it. Unfortunately, I think some of the bigger banks are still trying to figure out uh, how to implement this across a broad spectrum. Because what's happening right now is that everything is changing so rapidly. You have less than two weeks ago the CARES Act being implemented or enacted as law. So something that's enacted as law takes time to implement into society and as policy. And so what Congress uh, enacts as law and what the president signs into law is different than what the SBA puts into a two-page application to help you with disaster assistance. Uh, there's a major disconnect there, and we have to bridge that gap. That being said, the CARES Act on the Congress website is 880 pages long, I believe, uh, whereas these loans are two-page applications, and it's been evolving rapidly. Um, uh, it's been evolving from a very extensive online application that had uploads of tax returns and personal financial statements and a lot of information to give and quite frankly the website appears to have crashed on the SBA and uh, now they've rolled out a completely streamlined application and made it a much easier process. That being said there are two loans. We're talking right now about the economic injury disaster loan. That's an SBA disaster loan and we'll get into the details of that later. That needs to be compared and contrasted and evaluated along with the Paycheck Pro Protection Program loan, which is a loan that you may have heard of that's forgivable if you use the funds to pay for payroll uh, of your workers. One of the things that uh, the government really wants to do here is keep people employed, keep businesses open, and we want to be open to that. And uh, this is what uh, these the purpose of these funds is to be used for. Bob, would you like to add anything? I guess um, a, a couple of things, um, perhaps, as, as Adam has already told us, we'll go into more detail on those loans. I think about it, and this will be a segue to the second point, I think about it as, you know, when you're a business owner and you're thinking about um, capital, obviously one approach to uh, um, making sure that your business has adequate capital is to accumulate as much capital as possible. Obviously, part of that, um, capital management is to also uh, make sure that you're preserving capital as much as possible and so this that's where we get into the second bullet point here where we're talking about how do we manage the risk associated with the coronavirus and what it does to our businesses and so the first thing I would say and this is not a shameless plug for lawyers even though I happen to be one but talk to your lawyer um, you have um, contracts that are important to your business and relationships that are represented by those contracts that are important to the business. They were important yesterday and they're going to be even more important tomorrow um, as we manage our way through this. So for instance, I talked to my landlord this morning and told him that I wasn't going to be paying rent for the month of April. Um, you know, that's, that's in, in some senses, it feels like that's a um, very scary conversation to have. On the other hand, the reception that I got was, we really appreciate you reaching out to us. We're interested in a long-term relationship with you. And so talk to your attorney and have your attorney help you navigate through your contracts and figure out 
what you're going to do in order to preserve capital because of the uncertainty of where we're actually headed. Um, along the same lines, you might um, contact your insurance agent and have your insurance agent review your policy with you. You might be surprised to find that there are business interruption provisions in your um, insurance policy that may give you a claim that will help you get through this process as well. And so it's a good time to, um, if you haven't talked to your insurance agent in a while, it's a good time to renew that friendship because you'll find that um, um, that may be another resource that you can draw on at this time. And then finally, be um, aware of and um, um, conscious about um, the, 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 the impact that you don't know yet that this may have on your financial statements. And so um, the financial accounting guidelines are, are um, suggesting that perhaps there ought to be footnotes and dis, um, disclaimers about the accuracy of financial statements that you're going to want to make sure that you include in your statements, particularly as you're giving those statements to other people to rely on, whether that be bankers or um, investors or whatever, and so talk to your accountants as well. So, so get as much capital as you can and hold on to it, I think, are the, the summary of the first two points. Adam, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, just a uh, couple short points on managing risk. Uh, I, I think you want to view your attorney as your trusted advisor and friend in this, in this matter. You have a lot of uh, issues pending and, and you're going to want to understand you're going to want to have a, a, a brief consultation whether it's uh, how to deal with uh, terminating employees rehiring employees um, dealing with confidentiality issues cyber security issues uh, and and even your own contracts and performance criteria on your contracts and force majeure principles and uh, you're going to want to uh, to talk to your attorney uh, in addition to that, uh, as Bob mentioned, insurance policy uh, coverage for business interruption for property damage, uh, if it may so exist, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, force majeure issues. And uh, finally, with respect to financial statement impact, if you haven't issued 2019 financial statements, uh, I have implemented a disclosure uh, for 2019 because this pandemic, or, or I should say this virus, originated in 2019, and uh, we should be disclosing the impacts of it on our financial statements, uh, but it shouldn't necessarily change um, uh, financial statement numbers because those, uh, the knowledge of, of those numbers and, and the impact is, is really occurring in 2020 as we start to evaluate contracts and whether materials are going to become more expensive or uh, in shorter supply or uh, whether we can utilize our labor force as efficiently and productively as possible. So we're going to want to understand our financial statements, analyze our commitments to contracts, whether we have uh, contracted prices for uh, source materials or labor and whether we can uh, continue to uh, operate under those conditions of those contracted prices and what opportunities we have to uh, adjust prices. So uh, there's a lot to do with financial statement impacts and uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg. With yeah, respect and, to, go ahead please. Adam, I'd, I'd also add, I think uh, that there's an opportunity to reach out to all your vendors, uh, whether it's Amazon or, or Microsoft, Azure, Google, uh, et cetera, and, and, and really work with them. Um, we're also seeing a lot of inbound calls for them from them, and they do want to make sure that everyone is fine through this. So definitely make sure you reach out to all, all those vendors uh, and, and other vendors as well and see what they can do for you during this time. Um, Good, yes. And, and, and really quickly, just to move uh, forward for the remainder of the bullets, because we have a lot of content to cover. Uh, understanding your revenues and costs during the pandemic, you want to be looking at uh, how this is impacting you, uh, how your revenues are declining, what are the prices for your products and services, and uh, you know, even for restaurant type example, into the future, everything is going to be changing. Are we going to be able to service our customers uh, to the same capacity? 
uh, based on social distancing principles and issues and things like that. So uh, you're going to want to continuously be updating uh, your financial information. This is a fantastic time to bolster your financial information. If you have capital to uh, invest in your business, it is very tax friendly to invest in software and hardware uh, for section 179 deductions if you're expecting uh, profit still. But uh, as businesses slow, there are things that we can do. There are reports that we've wanted. We wanted to implement dashboards or reporting tools. And this is a perfect opportunity uh, to look at your systems uh, and start to improve the information that uh, you are currently generating. Uh, a couple fun things that I, I like to do too are SWOT analyses and uh, SMART goals. Those are really good ways to engage your staff in remote locations uh, to understand what are the strengths and weaknesses of the business, what are the opportunities and threats presented by the coronavirus and other environmental factors going on. Everybody should look at that as a baseline approach to how to move forward. And SMART goals, goals being specific, measurable, uh, achievable, realistic, and time-bound, uh, those are all principles that you want to use to establish goals and targets and evaluate this. You can Google SWAT, goal, SWOT analyses and SMART goals and uh, find excellent articles uh, about those to implement in your business. And just one final note is uh, the IRS and SEC have delayed filing requirements, so that should give you some breathing room to just understand your business, contact your vendors, as Florence is suggesting, contact your insurance company, as Bob is suggesting. It's time to reevaluate things, and uh, we want to use this time to do so. We want to secure capital in order to do it. Well, and I'll add one thing that's not on here, and just and then we'll, we can flip the slides, but I think it's a thread that's gone through all these points. Um, it's all about communication. It's communicating with your employees. It's communicating with your vendors. It's communicating with your customers, your attorneys, your insurance agents. Um, there has never been a better time um, to make sure that you're being understood and that you are understanding the needs of all the people who are doing business with you as well. This this webinar actually is a great example of the kind of communication that you should be embracing through your business. Thanks, uh, Adam and Bob. Let's uh, get into the details of some of this. Uh, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. Um, Bob, uh, you want to give an overview? Yeah. And yeah, let me let me just start with this. So, so the Economic Injury Disaster Loan is actually a program that's, that is not part of um, the coronavirus pandemic legislation. It's actually been around for a long time. What is what what makes it relevant to this coronavirus um, um, issue is that all 50 states have been dis declared disaster areas, and so all of a sudden now we're drawn into um, the purview of this program. Um, and so um, it's what it's the first um, response that was out there. People were actually making applications under the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program before the CARES Act even passed. Um, and so, um, and many of you may have already made application. Um, you know, um, it, it, loans are available up to $2 million. Um, and these are loans that are coming to you directly from the Treasury. In other words, there is no intermediary bank. And so um, you don't, if you go to talk to your bank about an economic injury disaster loan, you might get a quizzical look because it's not part of the 7A SBA loan program. Um, typically, um, it's for businesses that are under 500 um, employees. There's lots of rules around um, uh, um, the kind of business that you are and what, uh, and what kind of classification you may have. So it, you may actually find that you can be um, an applicant and have more than 500 employees. Um, and Adam can talk a little bit about that. Um, but um, these loans are intended to um, um, be available to help you navigate um, the costs associated primarily with running your business. So you can see on the left-hand side of the slide that you can use the funds to pay existing debt. You can pay um, payroll. You can pay accounts payable. 
employees sick leave, you can pay um, utilities, all that sort of thing. On the right hand side, you'll see the things that they don't want you to do with it, and I won't spend very much time with that side of the slide. Um, this process um, is the process that now has a web application form. So later on in this slide deck, I think there's a link that will tell you where to go if you want to apply for one of these loans. Um, my advice to you would be apply. Um, in our region, in Dallas, um, I had the opportunity a week ago today to speak to the administrator who's administering this program for the SBA. And his advice to us was simply, get in line. He said, you know, because of the anticipated volume, we're, we're processing these applications very quickly and there's not the need for an inter intermediary bank. And so um, these loans are 100% guaranteed by the um, SBA. And, or, well, they're actually made by the SBA. So these are not forgivable loans. And we'll talk more about the interplay of this program with the payroll protection program um, but um, uh, I, I think um, it, you're, um, you, you ought to apply for this. You don't have to accept the loan if you don't like the terms when you get it, but the terms are, if you're a for-profit, the interest rate is 3.75. Um, They're intended to be 30-year loans. If you're a non-profit, it's two and three quarters. You know, this is a program that it's government assistance um, disguised as a loan program. Adam, do you want to say anything else? I will dive into some of the details of applying for these loans a little bit later in the program, but I can't echo uh, Bob's thoughts more, Bob's recommendation more to apply early. And uh, I was also in contact with the regional director of the SBA in Santa Ana, California last week, and uh, they're encouraging everybody to apply. Uh, like Bob said, you don't have to take the loan. There's a good financial practice to getting your documents together in any case, uh, getting your 2019 financial statements closed out, uh, getting a year-to-date profit and loss statement and balance sheet and your bank accounts reconciled you know, up to today and having your payroll ready uh, and, and, and closed out for the quarter because uh, as we'll get into in, in just a moment, uh, with respect to the Paycheck Protection Program loan, uh, we're going to want to know what payroll is, and we're going to try to uh, maximize uh, that loan value because it's uh, almost entirely based on uh, your payroll. So with that being said, let's talk a little bit more about uh, the payroll protection loan. Bob, you want to lead into that, please? Yeah, so this, this, this is actually part of the CARES Act. So this, this loan has been on the books. Uh, the availability of this loan has been on the books since the 27th of March, so it's brand new. Um, if you called your bank when you saw that the CARES Act had passed, if you called your bank on Monday morning and said, hey, I want to apply for one of these, care, one of these payroll protection program loans, you probably got a pretty um, confused look from your banker. Um, they were made available by statute but the banks didn't know anything about what they were supposed to do. Um, that's changed this week to give you an idea of how fast things are changing. So um, yesterday, I guess uh, actually it was um, Tuesday night, um, the, the payroll protection loan application was released um, to the banks. Um, and so your bank now knows that what the application looks like and they're beginning to figure out what they need to support that application. The program opens up, they, their banks are being um, told to begin accepting applications tomorrow. Um, so I called my bank this morning and said, I need the application. I want to know what all supporting documentation you need. And they, they got that information to me today. Even though you can apply tomorrow, um, the banks don't have any guidance yet as to what the SBA is going to do with those applications and what the funding is going to look like on the back end of that. So. We, I don't know if we're rushing to a roadblock or, or what, but you need to um, 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 know that there's the opportunity to apply for this loan tomorrow. This loan is 100% um, guaranteed by the SBA, so it, it is processed through um, an affiliated bank. Um, loans, the loan size you can see on this slide is, is limited to a, an upside, a top end of $10 million, but it's calculated to be 
two and a half times your average monthly payroll. So if you go back for the last 12 months and you look at your average monthly payroll, and then you are uh, and determine that amount, then you are eligible for a loan up to two and a half times that amount. Um, the loan, as Adam indicated, is forgivable. Um, it's forgivable based on your behavior over the eight months after the time that you get your loan. So the idea is the name would indicate it's a payroll protection loan. So they want to make sure that you're using the money to continue to employ your workforce. Um, so if you continue to pay your people and you have no change in the workforce or anything like that, then you have the opportunity to apply for the forgiveness of 100% of the loan. Um, if you don't, if you lay people off or if you reduce salary, um, there's a calculation that we don't have all the details on yet, but there is, an, there is intended to be a calculation that would scale back the amount of um, um, forgivability that you would be entitled to. Um, there's other points here that I'll let Adam talk a little bit more about in terms of catch-up, et cetera. Um, again, this comes through your bank, so you should start talking to your bank today. Um, I think with all these things, the earlier you get in the queue, the more likely it is that you will get the um, capital assistance that you need. Adam, I'll turn it over to you. Sure. Well, I'll give you a little bit more of a taste of the payroll protection program right now. I really, really like this program. And then, uh, once again, later on in the program, we are going to actually bring up uh, some, some very specific details about it. Uh, but as Bob mentioned, this is basically calculated at two and a half times your average monthly payroll. And it is your full great gross payroll. It's uh, inclusive of payroll taxes. It's inclusive of retirement benefits like 401k contributions. And, uh, uh, and it's also inclusive of, um, we'll, we'll get to that. But, but that being said, you, you want to look at uh, your full and, and, and inclusive of uh, health care benefits, too. So uh, you want to include all of those items in your average monthly payroll calculation. Uh, the banks are asking for, or my bank asked for, a W-3 form, which is the 2019 W-3. It's a sum of all the W-2s. And it's uh, what's reported to the federal government as your W-2 wages for all of your employees uh, for the 2019 period. But uh, you can use even more recent payroll numbers. You can use March 31st, the last 12 months, if your payroll has actually increased uh, to enable yourself to uh, or your company to increase its loan amount. And as I said, include your health care benefits, include your retirement benefits in this calculation. What I would not include, even though there might be instances and indications that some may be allowed, is your 1099s. If your 1099s are independent contractors, I believe that they should be applying for this loan themselves, and they shouldn't be classified as an employee of yours. I think it really, really muddies the waters. But this loan is designed to keep people employed, and the government wants to get people reemployed. Uh, so if you've displaced your workers, if you've furloughed your workers, terminated them, or otherwise reduced their salaries, uh, the federal government is going to let you catch up. Uh, they'll let you rehire employees, and uh, you'll still be available for uh, the uh, forgivability provisions. Also. It could provide an opportunity to reduce your salaries up to 25% and still uh, obtain forgivability. And in addition to that, if you just simply can't manage with those payroll levels, you might have partial forgivability. So uh, this is a great program to really even help out the U.S. government and, uh, once again, keep people employed because it is going to be, the, the longer this goes on, and the more we uh, displace workers, the more difficult it's going to be to get out of it. So the government is hopefully being very proactive here in getting these loans out to people. Let's see that they actually get out to people. Bob and I have very personal experiences that some of these loans are supposed to, these checks are supposed to be mailed 
Uh, one thing in particular about the payroll protection program, uh, I'm sorry, um, the economic injury program that is uh, super nice is when you go online right now to apply and it's, it's a really short application, one of the last questions is, do you want a $10,000 instant direct deposit into your bank account? And uh, this $10,000 is a forgivable initial advance on the economic injury disaster loan. So uh, those checks I heard were supposed to be mailed uh, towards the end of this week. Bob might have uh, even more anecdotal uh, support of that. So they want to get these checks out. They want you to be hiring workers. Yeah, and I would I, I would underscore that as well. So that that initial ten thousand dollars is actually a grant that's available to your business. Um, it is um, part of the application is that you input your account um, checking account number and your bank routing number. Um, the application says that the funds will be in your account within seventy two hours. Um, I applied for our law firm on Monday, today is Thursday, I should get my $10,000, but as of this call, I don't have it yet. So um, I, I'm, I'm sure that I'll get it. I'm not sure that I'll get it within three days, but that's, that's you know, that alone, uh, I um, encourage you to go fill out the application. Um, one thing that I um, quickly want to talk about um, is that, and Adam, if you've got this in later slides, just stop me. But one of the things is um, there is a provision that if you apply for an economic injury disaster loan and you apply for a payroll protection loan, you probably won't get both of them, but you can convert a portion of your economic injury disaster loan to a payroll protection loan. The reason you would do that is because you that then that be, the amount that you convert becomes eligible for forgiveness. And so um, I don't want to get too deep into that, but I think what I want you to understand is you should apply for both. We'll figure out the details or let the government figure out the details, but you can take advantage of the forgivability provisions of the payroll protection program, even if you get an economic injury disaster loan. So just to interject real quick, uh, just to be clear, the $10,000 that Bob and Adam were talking about is related to the economic injury disaster loans. And for some of the questions that I start, I'm seeing coming in, yes, we will share these slides. Yes, we have URLs for some of these uh, online forms, and we will share them uh, as well in this. Um, <clears throat> uh, with that, I, I'm, I'm not going to take, uh, you, you all have been answering some of the questions that have been coming in. Uh, Adam, I'm going to, Adam and Bob, I'm going to bring it back to the payroll protection program summary. At this point, do you want to do the comparison or do you want to do the example? Yeah, let's talk about the comparison. I, yeah. That's where I would go. So what we've done here is outline a comparison of some of the, the key features of these loans. And like we said earlier in the program, this is law that was just implemented or just enacted. Now we're implementing this. And uh, the programs aren't fully implemented yet. And the banks haven't completely rolled this out yet. So. Uh, things are changing, but here's some general rules. We believe it's advantageous to apply simultaneously. There's not really a penalty for applying simultaneously. Uh, as Bob mentioned, there may be some interplay between the amounts forgiven, but um, you can apply simultaneously. And there's a lot of information at sba.gov, and I'll bring up that website a little bit later in the program. Uh, but that being said, I've outlined the SBA disaster loan, which is the economic injury disaster loan. On the left, the paycheck protection loan on the right. Um, one key difference is the SBA disaster loan, you apply directly with the SBA on sba.com. And it's a five to 10 minute application, hopefully for you guys. Um, in a, uh, alternatively, or in contrast, uh, the paycheck protection loan is something that's being rolled out by SBA lenders, by FDIC insured institutions, and other government approved institutions, but you're going to want to contact your banker and apply directly with your banker on that loan. Uh, that being said, I have very anecdotal evidence that the big banks have been slow to move on this, uh, but the community banks are out there and uh, 
you know, one other important point, even about managing risk in this situation, is uh, bank credit and what's happening with the banks as they're giving out all this money. And so, uh, if the banks are starting to run short on cash, uh, that could present problems for individual banks. Generally speaking, for a corporation at a bank, you are only insured FDI insurance that corporation for $250,000. I have a lot of clients that have more than $250,000 in their bank. And I'm talking about corporations. You can take other moves on individuals to put money in trust funds and CDs and things like that. But generally speaking, for a corporation, you're limited to $250,000. The FDIC wants you to diversify your funds. Uh, they want you to manage risk for the government. So if you have more than $250,000 at a bank, it may make sense to call up another competing bank, a community bank in the area, and move some money around and get some additional protection and help circulate money into the economy. Um, I, 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 so um, a couple of the other things we talked about, the, the initial $10,000 direct deposit is the SBA Economic Injury Disaster Loan, uh, whereas the Paycheck Protection Loan, it's focused on the two and a half times monthly payroll. Um, uh, what I heard directly from my SBA director, my regional SBA director, was that this is going to be a very quick application process on the economic injury disaster loan. You know, a couple key features to this is it may require a personal guarantee. If it's over $25,000, maybe some sort of pledge or collateral requirement. Um, but uh, they're generally looking to the credit score of the individual, the owner of the corporation. And the preliminary indication that I received was a 620 score and above. So, uh, and uh, what's happened on the SBA website, when you originally applied for this loan last week, you were required to give a personal financial statement. You were required to upload a lot of information, tax returns individual, individually and about the corporation. That being said, now the SBA website strictly says the SBA may lend on credit score alone and may make its credit uh, decision on credit score alone. So that's a really important feature of the SBA disaster loan versus the paycheck protection loan. Um, Bob, do you have more to add on these? No, I, my experience with our regional director here was exactly the same. I'm, I'm sorry, he doesn't want me to quote what he told me, but um, he basically said that they were rubber stamping applications that were lower than 500,000. Um, and so, um, it, it, you know, there's, um, it's just, uh, things are changing so fast and moving very quickly and the volume is going to exceed the capacity of uh, the people who are charged with um, clearing that capacity. So, uh, again, the point is, I think you just want to get in this line and make sure that you get in the line as soon as you can. Yeah, and a few limitations here. Uh, Probably one of the first things you want to do is just see that you make the SBA size requirements. Uh, do you have fewer than 500 employees? Uh, do you meet the revenue thresholds? There's a URL to a website on the slides, and we included the URL, uh, a hypertext to it uh, later on in the presentation. But there are size requirements. Certain industries, you can't have more than a uh, million dollars in annual revenues. Other industries are higher in the 20 to $30 million range. So it's industry dependent based on your NAICS code. Uh, and that being said, the, the bottom condition or limitation is affiliate issues. That may affect uh, a lot of different types of companies, but in particular companies that are funded by venture capitalists uh, or other uh, equity players, even stock option players that may have certain control rights uh, that may cause affiliate type issues. And really what happens on the affiliate issues is the SBA says if you have, if company A has control over company B no matter what it is, even if they have a minority stake but there's an opportunity for the, them to have control, we want the affiliate 
to be applying for this loan. We want the affiliate to uh, even assist for this, uh, provide assistance to this company and co-invest co -invest along with the SBA and share in some of the risks. So they're looking for the affiliates to uh, provide capital along with the SBA if you have control of that company. So there are many companies out there uh, privately held that may have affiliate issues that could cause concern and provided another URL at the bottom that provides a really great uh, handout, a PDF that the SBA has developed on affiliate issues. So if this applies to you, I recommend you go through that uh, PDF in great detail. And then a couple just really hopefully minor points is that if you've had a bankruptcy in the last seven years, if uh, you've had a misdemeanor or a felony, I've even heard uh, about clients that have had DUIs and uh, this this could impair your, your progress. So don't like to get so grim, but uh, be aware of these provisions before you get in and invest the time and, uh, and, and encounter more issues along the way. But once again, these are all generalizations too, and we don't know how this is exactly going to be implemented. I haven't seen a single loan approved under this program yet. Do you want to go back to the comparison, or? Yes, I uh, I can go back to the comparison, um, and we have questions coming fast and furious, so um, I I can start to weave some of these questions in, uh, Bob and Adam. Uh, now, or I think we should do that. I, th I think uh, I think part of the value of this program is going to be dealing with individual questions. So let's let's, just, let's, yeah. let's go to those. Yeah. Uh, so so my suggestion was going to be, Adam, do you want to uh, do you want to share your screen where you wanted to show how some of these work? And as they're as you're setting up, I'll start sending some of these questions. I'll start asking some of these questions. Yeah. Okay. Why don't you give me screen control and okay. I'll share my screen and we'll take you to the SBA website to begin with. Yeah. So Adam, I am making you a presenter now. So the one you of the what the SBA website, please. Yes. Yes. We can see. I can see your website. Your. Thank you. So one of the first questions that I'll ask that is easy. Hopefully we can knock that out. What are the requirements to get the ten thousand dollars forgiven? Thank you, Jeff, for that question. Um, so that 10,000, I guess the, the requirement to get the 10,000 is to fill out an economic injury disaster loan application and check the box that says you'd like the 10,000. That 10,000 is not, uh, it, it's a grant. And so what, even if your application were to have been denied later, you would still have the right to get the $10,000 without the obligation to repay. So just really quickly here, if you go into your Google or, or internet browser web bar and you just type in SBA, it probably pre-populates and you're going to be hopefully immediately directed to the SBA website. Now really quickly on the yellow banner up top here, there's a direct link to the economic injury disaster loan. So I'll just click here. Uh, to show you how easy this is, but you're going to, uh, it's a five-step process. Uh, there are some eligibility questions at the beginning and uh, how you're using uh, these funds, and then you can continue on. You're going to input your business information. Uh, then you're going to input business owner information. Adam, uh, can we go through this first step so that we can show them the business information piece? And then there are some specific questions I can ask. Yeah, you should be able to just click. Yeah, at this point, we're, we're yeah. not doing any. Uh, so one of the questions uh, that I think we can knock out is, uh, uh, can the, uh, this loan be applied for for rental properties? You're going to need to click these the boxes in the second yeah. section. You need to click all those. Yeah. So Bob and Adam, do you know if we can uh, if someone can apply for uh, rental properties? 
Um, so I haven't done it. Um, and, and there are some specific real estate um, provisions under the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. I don't know the answer to the question, but I think that if you go here and you begin to fill out the application, you'll quickly figure out whether it will apply or not. And so you're going to input your business legal name, your trade name, your EIN for the business or your social security number if you're a sole proprietorship, the organization type such as corporation, LLC, partnership, uh, whether you're a nonprofit organization, whether you're a franchise, uh, your gross revenues for the 12 months prior to the date of the disaster, and they're looking for a January 31st, 2020 uh, date for the 12 months prior. So they're looking for February 1st, 2019 through January 31st, 2020. I will tell you that I took the number off my tax return, my December 31st, 2019 tax return, and put it there. I didn't want to complicate it. I thought that was a lot of work, and I thought it would suffice for this, but I can't give you any uh, promises there, but that's what I did. And same thing with yeah. possibly sold. Uh, and right down below here, uh, rental properties, lost rents due to disaster, uh, mm -hmm. some other just really brief information, combined annual op. So when you have, if these don't apply to you, if you see on, um, uh, that some of the bars have read, these are required, but I would suggest and, that you fill out every item here and even just put zeros if, if these don't apply to you. So uh, that being said, should we uh, fill this out just really quickly and, and continue on? We, we, can, we can try that. One of the questions I'll ask you while you're doing that is, uh, the question that has been asked is, on the streamlined EIDL online application, there was no question related to loan amounts. So how beyond yeah. the $10,000 will they determine what, if any, loan amounts are being approved? What is the criteria they're going to use? <laughs> so <laughs> I don't have a definitive answer to that. Um, I've had, um, I've heard it from more than one source, um, but I but this but I have no assurance. But I've heard from more than one source that it that it's a that it approximates. Um, uh, they asked they asked for in the application. They asked for your total revenues and they asked for your cost of goods sold. So they're getting to a gross revenue line, um, and so it seems like it's going to be some calculation on gross revenues. And I've heard a couple of different people say that it that it may be six months of gross revenue, but I have no um, authority for that other than I've heard it more than once. Um, but it, it's going to be some calculation on gross revenues just based on the information that they're asking. Adam, have you heard anything on that? You know, I'm sorry, I wasn't uh, paying attention there so much because I'm trying to get Adam, the question is, yeah, the question is, how are they going to, as you, how are they going to uh, determine the loan amount beyond the, the 10K? Loan amount, I think, is going to be primarily determined based on the size of the business, such as revenues and your credit score. I think it's going to be a very simple process, but uh, we don't have that equation that they're going to be using. But my suspicion is it's going to be primarily driven by how large your business is and the primary indicator may be being revenues and then uh, and then once again your, your credit score uh, would be the second determining factor. Yep, I, I, I agree with that. So one question I, I, I have that just came in is uh, what happens to startups that are investing? So they have the expense, but they don't have revenues yet. And th there is a similar question that was asked earlier about uh, for the, at least for the payroll protection program, I think the entity was started sometime in maybe January, but payroll didn't start until uh, February, what can they use for their average uh, monthly payroll? 
So there's actually a provision in the payroll program, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to quote it chapter and verse, but there's actually a provision for new businesses under the payroll protection program. I don't know how the calculation is made in those cases. I think there's some ability to take an abbreviated period to determine your average monthly um, um, payroll, um, but I don't, I can't, I can't tell you what it is. Would, with respect to the other question about um, the economic injury disaster loan, I think that's a great example of um, uh, the, the unknown. Um, we don't know how those loans are going to be calculated yet anyway. And so I think if I were in that position, I would fill out the application um, and I would, um, you know, put in the information that I had, and if my gross revenues were zero, um, that's just the way it is. Um, I would I'd make sure I checked the box so I could get my $10,000, uh, and then I would hope that um, I would have the opportunity to um, um, talk to somebody and, and, and uh, come to some accommodation. It could be that you just fall between the cracks. I don't know the answer, to, but I think I'd still fill out the application. Thanks, so Bob. Just really quickly here, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to go past on this because I don't mm -hmm. want to mess up my own application and, and then put my own information uh, and override it or causing disruption in my process. But hopefully you saw that it's requesting, the website's requesting very little business information. Uh, there's just a few screens. The business owner information is similar information where you're going to input some personal details. Uh, your name, social security number, birth date, and, and such, and uh, then the additional information beyond that is uh, the banking information and, and additional certification, and that's really it. So uh, thanks, Adam. One of the one of the questions that has been asked, I think, uh, would be good by you to address. Uh, someone, uh, uh, Brad asks uh, that they prepared an SBA loan online, and I, I believe it was before this online form was available, and they received a loan number and e email with requested documents. They've sent them back, but they have no way of logging in to check the status. What would your recommendation be? Are you saying apply again online anyway? So what I was told by my regional SBA director was that in a few days, in two or three days, the SBA was going to run a credit check. And if you met that initial hurdle, you were going to be placed in a additional queue where it might take two to three weeks for the SBA, for an individual SBA loan originator or loan processor to collect additional information. If you did not hear, if if you did not pass the credit check portion of it, you would be hearing from the SBA within a few days. Now, I haven't seen this implemented yet, but right. I would suspect that you are going to be contacted by the SBA at some point in the next few weeks to continue to progress this loan. But as Bob mentioned earlier, and we talked about earlier, uh, the ten thousand dollars is supposed to be funneled uh, more quickly and uh, and we haven't seen uh, those amounts hit our bank account quite yet but I don't think that there's really anything that you can do uh, I can tell you um, you can contact the SBA they've been very responsive if you con if you go to the SBA .gov, um, and uh, you might look into contact SBA down here uh, on the left uh, I can tell you uh, they have employees working from home. I got into an initial, well, first of all, I called the regional office and they were closed uh, because of social distancing rules and things like that. But you can see down here to uh, for, for local assistance. And then uh, you, can you can find some information to contact your local office. And uh, there is a, uh, oh, I just saw here, please, uh, if you need help, please contact your SBA district office. Right. And so when I called, they were closed. I left a voicemail and a gentleman called me back 
the next day. He said he was working from home and he says that he was the one that gave me the information about the 620 credit score and uh, waiting three weeks to have your application processed and have a loan representative from the SBA reach out to you. Uh, in addition to that, after I didn't get somebody from the SBA because I was actually going to, and I left the voicemail, I was, uh, I called the 800 number, the 888, whatever the, the there's a toll free uh, assistance line uh, in, in here. And I, I contacted uh, that number, I, this customer service center here. And you did, I did that and I was number 221 in the queue that they tell you. And <laughs> it, it goes quickly. I think I was on the phone for an hour and a half, and, and this so, is where I talked to another very nice, knowledgeable person working from home. It was funny. I I had a good time doing it. I called, I went online and I ordered Pizza Hut. Pizza mm -hmm. Hut was delivered within 30 minutes hot. They're still operational. There's there's businesses out here that are trying to deliver us food. And you know, I had some fun with it too. I haven't had Pizza Hut in years. And uh, it's great. I think this answers one of the questions that we're getting about, um, you know, if they filled in the application wrong, uh, do I need to call uh, the SBA? Yes, call them. Adam has given you a lot of uh, wonderful suggestions on what to do while you're waiting to talk to them. Uh, I do have one question that I do want to get, get in before we run out of time that I'm seeing a lot of. Uh, there are a number of questions on uh, 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 equity uh, as compensation or owners that don't pay themselves but give themselves uh, some kind of a uh, um, uh, guarantee pay payment. Is there any way to get some of that into the payroll protection program? Do you both have uh, in the last seven minutes, three minutes, we have something on that? Any so, on that? so I'll tell you what we did. So I'm in exactly that position. So I have a law firm I'm an owner and um, I pay myself a guaranteed payment as my partner does. Mm -hmm. um, we, we included our guaranteed payments in our payroll calculation. I don't know if it's right or not, but we wanted to make sure that they were in there. Um, we also make year-end distributions to ourselves. Um, those distributions have the effect of taking our compensation above $100,000. Actually, the guaranteed payments do that, so we did not include the distributions. But my position is um, that, that those guaranteed payments, which everybody knows if you're a business owner, there's nothing guaranteed about them. Um, um, but um, we felt that those were um, a proxy for um, our monthly compensation, and so we included them. Adam, do you have any further guidance on that? Uh, no, I don't, but I wanted to answer the question regarding the corrections to the application, if that's okay. And just just to, to add a little yeah. bit more information and flavor regarding this application. The actual filing requirements on the paper application uh, talk about a personal financial statement, income tax returns, schedule of liabilities being required, and then additional information that may be necessary to provide within seven days. Uh, and that incurs a, includes a current year profit and loss statement, monthly sales figures, additional income tax returns. So uh, the point to this is you are going to be contacted by somebody. You have an opportunity to augment your file. I, I wouldn't disrupt the process. I wouldn't go back in and try to mess with things. I would wait for the SBA to contact you. I would, I would, I would um, furnish any additional information at that time and uh, I would not try to disrupt the process just like I didn't want to disrupt the process and go back into my application again. You will be contacted at some point. Be patient. They're working hard. I know they're working hard and uh, you'll have an opportunity to provide additional information, correct information, and uh, they may ask for more information. They may ask for this information. So we are uh, almost out of time, uh, and I do want to make sure that uh, we wrap up, but I will, um, I, what I will I tell everyone on, on the call, and this has been asked a lot, 
we're going to go back through the questions and try to make sure we answer them. I'm not trying to. I'm mm -hmm. not going to grab the presentation back, Adam. Uh, and um, we will have Adam's and Bob's information online. Uh, they are happy and willing to uh, be a resource. Yes. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. So please feel free to reach out directly to them. Uh, always feel free to reach out directly to me as well if you want. Um, and uh, let's 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 get through this together. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Uh, like I said, we'll we'll take the, the questions we weren't able to address, um, and 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 we will uh, give you answers to all of them, and we will send out information for Adam and Bob and this deck also, and the handouts. So thank you, everyone.